would like to start by thanking the organizers for an interesting meeting and for inviting me here. Yes, my permanent institution is Cambridge, but in the last couple of years um, I was also at Skoltech um, Moscow, the new research university uh, built in collaboration with um, uh, MIT. Uh, Kirill Kalinin is from Skoltiak doing his PhD and he's in the audience and I also refer to his poster during the poster session where there are a few more details to what I'm going to describe. And finally, Pavlos Lagudakis extended his uh, hybrid photonics lab also to Skoltiak and now we can safely say that we are fulfilled the dream of the former mayor of London, Ken Livingstone, who said before the Brexit, if Brexit will take place, he's going to defect to Russia. So we're preparing the plot for him probably to go there. Um, so what I'm planning uh, on doing today, so I'll start by introducing polariton condensates. What is the polariton and what are the properties of these condensates that are important for our experiments? Um, I will touch upon some previous work on polariton lattices uh, and the core, the main result of my talk is in proposition of having the quantum simulator based on polariton condensates. Um, it's not just the different particle which is used for quantum simulation, it's also a rather novel principle that allows the system to obtain the global minimum rather than local minimum. And in particular, I will explain that polariton condensates arranged in a lattice minimize, find the global minimum of the XY Hamiltonian. Uh, so written here in, the, in probably well familiar form, uh, the Hamiltonian that has the dot product of the unit vectors um, and there is a coupling between any two so-called spins represented by uh, Jij. If uh, these couplings are uh, of different sign, and of different value, then actually finding the global minimum of such Hamiltonian is an NP hard problem, non deterministic polynomial that requires non deterministic polynomial time to solve it. Um, and this Hamiltonian lies in the core of many systems, uh, from quantum liquids to uh, uh, BKT transition to uh, high temperature superconductors to um, of course, mag magnetic, uh, magnetic systems, etc. Uh, the system, when I talk about polariton condensates arranged in a lattice, I will talk more about it, I will describe in detail what I mean, but the first picture to have in mind is that I will show that we can pump, create condensates at the localized position of the two-dimensional space, here the de so that this is the cartoon of the density of, for instance, arrangement of six condensates and in such a way that they interact and they establish the difference of the phases. So in, of course for the condensate the individual phase um, cannot be measured, it varies with time, uh, but the phase difference is locked. So the phase difference between the condensates therefore can be read off and then when we talk about minimization of XY Hamiltonian we imagine this little for instance lattice where each if I fix the direction of one spot and then I talk about relative phases of other spots, they arrange themselves according to the optimally, optimally chosen phase configuration. The advantage of the system, as I mentioned, is in finding the global minimum rather than local minimum. And this is due to both condensation itself. This condensate, as I will show, is a laser. In, in its essence. And as we know from the normal operation of lasers, they maximize the gain, they maximize the number of, therefore, quasi particles or particles in the system. And that's uh, so by its construction, by the process of, of, the, of the condensation, the system condenses in the global minimum of this Hamiltonian, as I will show. The system, uh, the, the problem the system will solve is really NP hard because I will show, actually I'm not going to show that, talk too much on that, but um, non-nearest neighbor interactions are important. We can actually work with geometry with the pumping in intensity to create any geometry of the system 
Um, I will shortly touch upon some novel states, uh, like analog of spontaneously created discrete uh, vortex solitons. Uh, one of the advantages of the system is that it's very easy uh, to read off the solution, the minimum of this Hamiltonian, the values of the phases, because it simply comes from interferometry of the, the uh, interaction of the fluxes coming from each spot. So you don't need to actually go through interferometry. It's just reading uh, the density profile tells you what the relative phases uh, between the spots are. This is very similar to uh, um, how the quantized vortices were detected um, when we detected working with a group of Sergei Dimokritov in magnon condensates. When you have two condensates with finite momenta and the density wave actually gives you the usual um, this fork dislocation indicating the vortices. So it's quite similar, similar to that. Okay, and all this together, therefore, uh, these systems can be used as an analog quantum simulator. It's been already mentioned in a previous talk. Uh, the idea goes back to Feynman, who proposed that if we have high control over a particular system that can mimic, emulate the quantum system and condensed matter that we cannot control or measure, this can be used as a quantum, quantum simulator to predict differ, different phase transitions in a quantum system and again uh, um, give us the understanding of, of the system that we cannot actually solve on classical computer. Okay, so this is the plan. Uh, so what are the polariton condensates? Uh, the idea goes back to 60s that absorption of photon by a semiconductor excites electron. Electron goes to the excited state, leaving a hole. The superposition of states is exciton, is known as the exciton. Exciton is an excited state, so it emits photon. And now if mirrors, the Bragg reflectors are placed, uh, the photon will be reflected back into the semiconductor, will excite electron, will be re-emitted, uh, reflected, reabsorbed, etc., etc. So this creates another superposition of states known as exciton polariton or just polariton. So it's a quasi-particle. It's a particle in a sense that it has an effective mass. We can talk about impulse, we can talk about the densities of these particles, like we speak about other natural atoms or molecules, particles. Um, it's half light, half matter particle, so um, due to its excitonic component, it is matter, due to its photonic component, it's light, and it's four, five orders of magnitude lighter than an electron, than the mass of the electron. As we know, the Bose-Einstein condensation uh, temperature needed for Bose-Einstein condensation is inversely proportional to the mass of the particle. And so if particle is light, it tremendously increases the condensation temperature. So now instead of nanokelvin, microkelvin, we can talk about um, relative warmth of uh, cryogenic temperatures for um, inorganic materials that my talk will be focused uh, about. It's about 10 to 20 Kelvin. But with organic condensates, this temperature can be brought to the room temperature that gives, still gives the Bose-Einstein condensation. Okay, so in these experiments, we have um, exquisitely prepared material, the quantum wells, one atom thick of materials, indium, gallium, arsenic, aluminium, made in such a way that they can trap light of a particular color, of a particular frequency. And then as the Bragg mirrors, Bragg reflectors are placed, that creates high quality mirrors to reflect the photons back into the system. I can compress these mirrors in just these two panels to show what's happening in the quantum well. So this is where exciton lives, so it's essentially a two-dimensional system. In the experiment that I'm going to talk about, the laser is at high energy. The, uh, it produces the flux of carriers, polaritons that relax, scatter, emit phonon, and at the end of after all these recombination events, they condense at the bottom of so-called lower polariton branch of the spectrum. Because the photonic part of the spectrum and excitonic part spectra give rise to lower polariton branch and upper polariton branch, 
So this is the lower quantum state, that's where the particles go and this is where they are condensed. And what is important, all the information about the phase of the laser is lost during this process. So this we can talk about incoherent pumping that creates this condensate. This is very different to the normal operation of the system where, where the particles are created by lasers. So here there is no memory of what the phase of the laser that produced these particles in the first place was. Um, these mirrors are not perfect. So after balancing, balancing back and forth, polarity uh, photons escape. And uh, so there is, there, is, oh, there is loss and I can make the particle inside the cavity to live longer by simply increasing the number of layers. But um, the typical lifetime of the particle of the polariton in the cavity is about 5 to 10 picoseconds. But even in, in spite of such a short time, uh, there are many bouncing, these bouncing uh, collisions takes place when photo photon is created and destroyed, exciton is created and destroyed. So we can talk about um, steady state, quasi-equilibrium situation in the system. But because of the losses, laser has to be continuously creating supply of the particles. Some other properties of exciton polaritons. Uh, these are strongly interacting systems. They lie somewhat between. They are not as strongly interacting as superfluid helium, uh, but they are stronger, stronger interacting uh, than weakly interacting both gases, ultra-cold gases. Uh, the main source of the interaction comes from electron-electron exchange um, between excitons. I mentioned the short lifetime. Um, this is the curse and the blessing. On one hand, we don't have an equilibrium system. On the other hand, photon, photons, when they escape, they are part of the wave function of the condensate. So by vi visualizing it, whether putting CCD camera in K-space or real space, we have all the information about the Fourier transform, about energy spectra, as well as about the density distribution. Uh, from light, uh, polariton inherits uh, polarization of light. But usually, because of the imperfection of the underlying crystal, both components are uh, locked together, so we have equal population of spin up and spin down. So for um, what is following, I'm not going to distribute this spin degree of freedom. So the, the entire system is described by, by one order parameter, by, by one wave function. Okay. Um, our our um, uh, attempt to model these systems um, started from the usual gross pitayevsky equation. So again, we have polariton dispersion that for small momenta can be taken as parabola. So this is just a Laplacian. We have delta function interaction pseudo-potential, perhaps external potential that comes from the sample disorder. Uh, then we have incoherent pumping mechanism that creates the particles. Particles decay, so here they have finite lifetime. So we have the relaxation of the condensate and probably also nonlinear uh, losses associated. And then depending on how much uh, flexibility I would like to have to describe the incoherent pump, I can either have something very simplistic and at first actually that's what we were doing, we have just a constant, constant uh, pump. Uh, you can introduce kind of a Landau damping that comes from the interaction with non-condensed particles of the reservoir. Or you can go into the more details and actually write down explicitly equation on the reservoir and have the scattering rate from the reservoir into the condensate and therefore losses in the reservoir because of this conversion. Reservoir itself can decay with uh, some supplement reservoir by pump and then there could be diffusion but hot exciton reservoir um, because of the large mass diffusion is very, very small. So usually we can neglect, neglect this term. And in this formulation, it's also close to the genetic laser model, atomic laser model of Wouters and Carosotto. Okay, the story about pumping in sports um, star started with our proposal with Jonathan Killing that uh, let's, we propose let's just create the condensates at the corners of equilateral triangle. Of course, there will be outflow of the particles because first you create the heap, which is uncondensed particles. 
and then condensate is created on the top of this hill and start flowing sideways um, and when outflowing condensate meet they simply form um, the lattice the vortex lattice structure hexagonal vortex la uh, lattice so here shown this area is in enlarged showing plus and minus vortices arrange themselves in the lattice by itself, this proposal didn't seem to, of course, that what you would expect when you simply interfere three lasers, three laser beams, you know, the vortices will be created. What was interesting for us, first of all, when uh, you apply the magnetic field, then you would have some desynchronization, very interesting dynamics, etc. Um, and also, um, it was uh, kind of given to us, we didn't think much about it, we presumed that if we do that, these condensates will all actually all lock in phase. So there will always be zero phase between them. Because of this interaction, particles during the outflow bring information about the phase to another spot, so it kind of becomes coherently pumped from spot to spot. Um, this stayed as a proposal because we submitted it to PRL and the referees said, oh no, we don't think it could be possible to realize it experimentally. That was a pure theoretical proposal at the time. And then we took it to our colleagues at Cavendish and they immediately produced uh, this, uh, fulfilled this, um, this, this project. So they uh, pumped again in the corners of equilateral triangle and demonstrated the formation of the vortex lattice of exactly the same form. Okay. And all they saw, again, that these condensate just lock in the phase. There is a zero phase difference between the points where the condensates are created. And then they decided to look at actually what, but uh, it was interesting for them, the question of what happens and how the information actually propagates from spot to spot. So they um, also analyzed the configuration for two spots. So now I create spot here and here that made dark so that you can see the um, interference pattern between them, kind of interference pattern, because this is, uh, this is actually a density profile. It's a standing wave in this respect of the density. And, but what they measured what was quite surprising, and this became known as quantum fluid pendulum. Um, so two pumps were located 20 microns apart. By pumping again, you create the hot reservoir two hills of the hot reservoir excitons. So these hills actually in the cross section through the top, through the, through this, through the middle of these two pumps, uh, looks like a parabolic, para, like a parabola, right? And then this stage, so this is energy versus the distance between the center of the pump, and it showed the states of the quantum harmonic oscillator that probably was one of the first things we learned in quantum mechanics, the states for the, uh, the uh, eigenfunctions and the energy states of the, uh, of the Hamiltonian linear Schrodinger equation with the harmonic trap. And so these are exactly these energy levels with equal separation. Uh, and our explanation, explanation that we gave to this pattern is actually theory uh, was quite good in explaining that. We explained that um, if I take now this, again, cut my two pumping profiles, so I pump here and here, and then I look at the density across the line as a function of time, I can see that there are some oscillations going on between the two spots. So we said again, so the two spots will try to look in the face, but there are some oscillations um, at these pumping intensity that actually go in back and forth, and that what brings about these um, these uh, energy levels. So it seemed uh, it seemed to be a kind of um, you know well understood picture until uh, Pavlos Lagudakis uh, went back and decided to uh, look at more careful look at this problem more carefully, and he uh, was pumping uh, creating this again two pumping spots to condensate uh, just above the threshold. So not, not uh, very high energy like in the previous experiment that I showed. And then at the same intensity, he varied the distance between the spots. And it turns out that in this configuration, then the, the phase difference changes between zero and pi. So this is small, small distance and I fixed, so in order to show you relative phase, 
I will fix the phase for this one and then show relatively to this one, this is pi. Now these two, change the distance slightly, now you see the maximum in the, in the center, so it's a constructive interference of the density waves. So this is zero, uh, zero phase difference. I shift it further apart and then there is a minimum in the center, so it again indicates uh, the pi phase difference between the spots. They went further, they've done it for, again, they repeated the experiment for three spots in the corners of equilateral triangle and it did determine by changing the distance the side of this equilateral triangle, the system goes from being uh, zero phase difference between the spots with maximum in the center. It goes to the situation when there is a 2 pi over 3 uh, difference between the spots with therefore vortex in the center because as we now go around this configuration, the phase can change by, uh, changes by multiple of 2 pi. And we can talk about positive and negative vortex sitting, sitting in the center. So then the question was how to explain that. And um, to explain that, we uh, looked at this configuration as the sum of the wave functions of the two condensates. So again, we have stimulated relaxation of the off polaritons. Um, due to its operation, the probability of the particle to condense, to join the, the condensate, increases with the number of particles in the state. Therefore, the system is trying to maximize the total number of particles. Okay? So if I approximate the wave function of the entire system as the sum of the two wave functions of individual condensates with a phase difference given by this delta theta and do it in Fourier transform, then I will recover the density of the isolated spots plus the term that depends on the cosine of the difference of the phases and where the strength of the interaction is given by this integral over the Hankel transform of the, um, of the wave function of individual, uh, of individual spot multiplied by the Bessel function of the, uh, the first Bessel function, the zero of the Bessel function that depends on the distance between them. And therefore for this integral as this function changes its sign, the J, the coupling, also changes the sign. So if this coupling is positive, then to maximize this, both condensates should be in phase, so they phase lock with zero phase difference. If J is negative, we say that the coupling is antiferromagnetic, and then to, uh, to maximize this expression, the difference of phases should be pi. Right? Then the maximum will be achieved. That gives pi. Uh, phase difference, and if J is uh, negative for triangle, then the phase difference is 2 pi over 3. Okay? So that's what the explanation. And now why is it interesting? So first, it turns out to be a unique system where the flow actually changes the phase of the source, in a sense, because we're creating these spots but the phase that they go going to acquire, the phase difference, is actually modified by the distance and by the outflow, so the configuration of the, of the experiment. And also the system, the most importantly, the system realizes the global minimum of the XY Hamiltonian because we can extend this formula and therefore show that for, uh, for, the, if, for the two condensate, this is what the system maximizes, therefore the system of n condensates will try to minimize the xy Hamiltonian and from the process of the condensation itself, the system will actually settle to the global minimum of this Hamiltonian. And now, um, this is just a schematic therefore of what we do and how we map the phases. So again, we are using the spatial light modulator, we create condensates at any given geometry. There is no restriction, it's all just done by spatial light modulator. By varying the distances and the intensity, the width of the pump, uh, we can change, we can have positive and negative couplings with different strength and therefore that creates the lattice or the graph on which the XY Hamiltonian is minimized by the system. So this is the general concept. 
So now let me uh, say a few words on um, what do we know and how the, uh, we simulated the system. So I start with the system that I already described, now just writing everything explicitly. There is a Landau damping, there is an interaction, kinetic energy, um, there is a repulsion, the blue shift due to interaction with the reservoir, there is the pump and decay, I neglected nonlinear losses here, and there is also the equation for the time evolution of the density and the shape of the condensate, of the hot reservoir. We're looking for steady state. The system should achieve the steady state, so I can use Madelang transformation to rewrite these equations um, in steady state. And then I can see that from this kind of integrated Bernoulli equation, I can see that uh, there is a constant flow of um, constant uh, constant velocity away from the pump and I can evaluate, I can evo evaluate what this really is by doing the asymptotic matching um, at the center of the pump and matching it to the far field. And then that gives uh, now a uh, coupling coefficient in terms of explicitly in terms of the outflow wave number that depends on other parameters of, of the system. Okay. Um, the density of the Hankel transformation, in this case, for the function, for the wave function like that, it will peak at Kc, right, at the outflow wave vector, at the wave vector that corresponds to the velocity wave from the pump. So I can approximate it by a rectangular function and then evaluate um, exactly what the coupling coefficients are, introducing the first order Bessel functions, if the width of my pump is very wide, so epsilon is very small, goes to zero, because this is the width of the Henkel transformation is inversely proportional to the width of the, of the wave function in real space. Therefore, this gives rise to the Bessel function. But generally, we don't have wide pumping spots, but this analysis tells us that actually this could be best approximated by the cosine Kc times the distance between the spots, and the parameters of the system, the actual, the, 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 um, uh, the intensity, the size of the pump, etc., etc., the scattering rate, they all be absorbed by the change in the phase. And then we take our model, our complex Ginsburg Landau couple, coupled with the equation for the reservoir, and we can find the region where there is a switching when the, maxim, when the number of particles is maximized for zero phase difference and pi phase difference. So, and just plot this as in, so this comes from the numerical simulation, and this fits extremely well with the cosine KCD with a given, with a fixed phase. Okay, so now we know how to control the sign of the coupling between, between the spots, and now it's time to show you some of the experimental data and how the, again, the analytics complements, complements that. So, first, experimental data on the chain. So we realized an Ising chain of the condensates. Now, KCD, so out, uh, outflow wave vector times D is 1157, so it falls somewhere here. So we know this is anti-ferromagnetic coupling. And indeed, there is a minimum between, between the spots, and therefore, the phase difference is pi. So you have 0, pi, 0, pi, 0, pi, alternating Ising spin. If we take now the distance from the next band, where we expect the ferromagnetic coupling, indeed, there is a maximum appearing in the, between the spots. And that corresponds to all the chain to acquire zero, zero phase. Um, I wanted to mention on passing that this system actually creates something rather new. Because we got, we, we talk a lot about this conference about the vortices that normally exist on non-zero background. Uh, there are also another class of vortices predicted in optical lattices and photonic crystals. When you have this kind of um, structure, you, can, you, can, you have these condensates uh, with a phase winding around them. 
uh, and then we say that there is an energy flux between these, these, uh, um, these condensates and the vortex, therefore, but it exists on absolutely zero background, zero density background, a negligible density background. Um, the term of discrete vortex soliton has been coined for the structures like that. But the difference here is that you actually imprint the phase. The laser beam imprints the phase rotation around the center. In our case, we have spontaneous vortices. I go back again to the same picture that illustrates the vortex of the multiplicity one for triangular, for a triangle, for the three spots, the phase difference is two pi over three. And then we went to five and seven condensates and then the phase difference here, the difference between adjacent um, spots is four pi over five. And therefore, as we go around, the multiplicity of the vortex in the center is two. For seven condensate, then we have multiplicity three. So by, <clears throat> and this is numerical simulation, confirming what we see here. Uh, so by simply changing the distance between the spots, therefore we can create this spontaneous discrete vortices that are quite therefore different from um, other vortices that we talk about in the field. But so what about the simulators? So I have, don't have uh, much time. So when people talk about quantum simulators, it's really quantum board games. Um, the setup for quantum simulator is different, but the concept is clear and it consists of three steps that you need to announce for your quantum simulator. So first, you announce which particle you're going to take and different groups invested in taking neutral atoms, ion, electrons, so here I'm talking about polaritons. Arrange them in a grid. So depending on the system, you may have different flexibility of how to do it. Uh, for instance, in ultra-cold gases, the traditional setup is this optical um, lattice, so the square or triangular optical lattice. Uh, similar for trapped ions uh, and for, say, superconducting loops. Uh, D-Wave, the notorious uh, first com commercially available quantum simulator, uses so-called chimerograph, where you have four knots and each of these four connected to these four, but not between themselves, and then you have some uh, links, therefore, between each of the, uh, of the eight nodes that you have. Um, the question to ask here also how scalable the system is. And then the next thing you do, you explain how you tune the interactions to mimic a more complex material. Uh, so I would wanted to make analogy with ultra-cold atoms, therefore, because this is the paper from Science where they realized the individual building blocks and detected various configurations, ferromagnetic, they called it when all in phase, rhombic, spiral, different chains. Um, and we have done in the same spirit, but instead of just taking four, uh, five, we took four, and again, varied the distance and saw different, different configurations, um, different spin um, realizations, and again, this shows the experimental result, and this comes from, uh, from the model. Unfortunately, you don't see the details here, but again, the, uh, the presence, because the quality, I have it better on my, on my computer, but again, by simply counting the number of nodes between the spots, you can say what is the uh, phase distribution between, between them. Then we went to um, other lattices, so this is uh, the, blocking, uh, the individual block for, um, for the prototype of the square lattice, and again, you have either antiferromagnetic couplings with pi phase difference, zero phase difference, but you can also go to this configuration, so-called compass 90 degrees. So um, being able to, uh, to have this lattice, you can address uh, various materials where the orbital degrees of freedom distinguishes between the direction of the, of the links, of the couplings between, between the nodes. So in one direction it could be ferro, uh, in another it is antiferro. And we also we were uh, rather happy to see this realization. Again, just ca counting these nodes, it's clear that this is antiferro, it has minimum in the, in the center, and this is ferro configuration. And finally, for the uh, rather random graph, so this is now five, five spots with one being slightly displaced, um, and this breaking of, uh, of the symmetry 
is clear on this picture because you have a single diagonal for this rhombus, but then you have two lines connecting these two. And that's again when you have the winding, so it's, you can think of it as plus vortex, minus vortex, plus vortex, and again by analyzing these phases and trying to get the steady state in our model, we have very good agreement with, with, experimental, with experimental setup. Okay, so um, I think this is, this is all I wanted to, to show you. And in the summary, um, uh, in the summary uh, we are quite excited that now we, we can use these incoherently pumped condensates in any geometry, in any graph configuration to realize the global minimum of the XY Hamiltonian. The XY Hamiltonian, again, is interesting because it's the simplest model that undergoes this U1 symmetry break and transition. You add the phase to each spot and nothing changes. So um, this model has been studied uh, for quantum phase transition for unconventional superfluids, predicting various uh, spin glasses, structures, um, ice spins, uh, high temperature superconductivity. Uh, we can study frustrated um, antiferromagnetism using these models. Uh, this can be used in topological quantum information. For instance, this compass 90 degree model has been proposed as a prototype for topological quantum computer. Um, I want to mention also that I mentioned that the uh, finding a global minimum of X by Hamiltonian is actually an NP-hard problem. And many uh, interesting optimization problems are proven to be mapped into this model. So once we can solve this, it means that we can cover a large um, set of other problems that also belong to the same class. Uh, we believe that this condensate may have advantages uh, with the main rival, atomic condensates, apart from individual control. And I know by using the masks in atomic condensate, you also can actually increase the capability of um, uh, trying different geometries. Um, here we have really, I, I emphasize, I think now I emphasize for the third time that the global minimum rather than the system does not uh, get stuck into the local minimum, it really condenses to the global minimum, plus we have really um, can address this situation at the room temperature which of course opens completely new route for the, for the actual devices. We, can, we don't need to do interference measurement because we can simply do it from um, from the density profiles of the standing wave between the lattice, uh, lattice sites. I showed you some um, novel structures that can be detected in, this, in the system. And the most, uh, uh, we are mostly excited that we can perhaps try to work on quantum simulators in this, in this framework. And I would like to finish by showing you what Skoltec is going to look like. It's not here yet. This is the construction plan. Right now we have a huge hole in the ground. But the hybrid photonics quantum fluids laboratory there is always on the look for, on the lookout for PhD students and postdocs. So thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Let's see if we have questions. Uh, Hold. Just speak into the microphone. I have two questions. So on your page 15, so what type of kernel functions you use at the G naught? No, it's a Bessel function. So what's the form? What would it look like a G naught? Um, the Bessel function. So it can oh, be approximated one okay. over okay. square Sorry. root of the argument times That's... cosine. Yeah, I, did, yeah, I, mean, so I didn't uh, hear. Okay, and the second question is in your this uh, uh, discrete system, usually how large is the system? What's the number of the n usually? Uh, for the experiment? Mm, for your simulation. Um, okay, the experiment, the actual experiment so, so far, mm -hmm. um, we have uh, good analysis up to seven, but also five by five, so 25 that are, that are locked. And in a system, it's two-dimensional system. Whatever the experiment shows, we can just put it, uh, put it and see. The, the, but the problem is, you see, um, 
during the experiment, again, because of this process of the condensation, which is uh, quantum by itself, you know, that's why the system reaches the global minimum, right? Mm -hmm. In the simulations, of course, you have initial condition, you know, and you're most likely to find the local minimum rather than global minimum, so you have to randomize your initial conditions in the search of the, of the local minima. So the idea is that with the number, with the growing number of spots in a system, of course the actual experimental realization will be able to give you solution when the classical computer can no longer do that. So this is the main idea, this is replacement of new principle for the computing. But for the small number of spots, of course we can simply verify um, verify using our numerics and this is the way to do, right? We try on a small right small uh, sub-lattices to see that, you know, we really, really know what we're doing. You have sense. done simulation, right? Yeah. And uh, what type of, do you set the boundary condition for this discrete system or you don't? No, it's zero that? because you want to be, uh, you know, there is a decay in the system, so everything dies out. So you have to be, uh, you know, to have sufficiently large box so that there is no reflection from the boundary, right? But, you know, the solution goes, there is an outflow, and then they decay, and by the time they reach, they reach the boundary, there is a density, uh, the density is zero. Even for the lattice model, like a discrete system, it's still decay? No, the density has to become zero, yes. So wave function should become zero on the boundary. I it's see. unlike gross pitayevsky it's unlike the uniform superfluid, where, you know, you have to be careful how you set up the boundary, but this is not, not the case. You know that it has to be zero there, away from, the, from where you create, because it's a dissipative-driven system, right? You create it at the final, at the particular uh, place, and then there is outflow of particles that only subject to decay. They will decay away from the pumping spot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. More questions? No, can I ask briefly, can you clarify the difference between vortices in this system and vortices in uh, more usual condensates? So, um, so I want to just, in, in vortices that, are, uh, it, it, <laughs> there are several vortices that I've shown here. I mean, the novelty is in the following. Um, if you have uniform, if you have helium or condensate, trapped condensate and vortice, vortices exist there, on rather non-zero, um, on, uh, on a high density background, let's say. And then they really, they're very non-local, uh, sorry, non-linear, you know, the classical hydrodynamics uh, applies when you're away from the center of the core, so they have identity on their own. The vortices that I um, uh, were in my talk, they were either linear, when there was just a superposition, they were formed by superposition of the wave function. These are linear, they don't have character on their own. These are zeros of the wave function, there is a winding around them, but they don't have the dynamics because there is no non-linearity associated to them. Um, and then there is another class of vortices that I mentioned when, again, the phase winding is given, so the most importantly is that there is an energy flux between the spots. The fact that you have zero here, I mean, you have zero density background there anyway, so the vortex here, discrete vortex, again, it doesn't have its own mobility, let's say. It's just, it's just there because of the fluxes, because of what happens at the, with the phase difference distribution around these, uh, around the, uh, around these spots. In our case, it's something in between because it's non-zero background, but at the same time, we do not impose the phase difference like in these experiments, let's say that are imposed by the laser beam. Here, these vortices will be created spontaneously. And then you can have multiply charged vortices, they're completely stable, unlike, unlike what we know uh, will happen in uniform condensates. So, so these structures are some of, they're quite different from the usual superfluids, let's say. They're quite, they're somewhat similar to these discrete solitonic vortices, but they have something which is rather unique that doesn't exist in any other system. Thank you. More questions? Uh, okay, on th that figure, the sign of vortex uh, does not, uh, be, it cannot be fixed. 
This in one? The, yeah, yeah, yes. So is, that a, uh, is there a spontaneous breaking of chiral symmetry? Yes. This is actually a very good, very good question in the sense um, that in experiment, uh, the experiment that I've showed here, it's really the averaging of many, many um, realizations because this is, this is CW, continuous wave, but it's, it's a very short impulses. So for each impulse, you have the vortex of its own sense, in a sense, and then it averages out to produce this configuration. Um, we do have laser now that will be with which we can see the individual single shot experiment and then you would see just one vortex either in, in one direction or another and we can we can understand the sense of a direction again by fitting this uh, this function between the spots because once you have averaging you add in this with something the same thing but with minus so therefore, you're losing information. It just comes, you know, either notch in between or maximum in between. But right. So in these average experiments, you know that you have vortex, but you have many realizations when the vortex was plus or minus. But with a single realization, yes, there would be symmetry breaking. We will be able to see a single one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't see any more questions. So we say thank you, Natalia. Okay.